Hey everybody, this is James from Cutlass. And this is John Micah from Cutlass. Welcome to the Kingdom Core Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Kingdom Core Podcast. I'm your host, Sean. And Chris. And Chris. And... We are back with uh, another after interview. After a long hiatus. Um, after a long hiatus. For I a band out of hiatus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I am very sorry uh, that it had taken so long. Um, as you guys know, I moved, my wife and I packed, packed up and moved across country. And it's just been um, a very good past three months, but also very crazy and busy. And um, the industry has also been very busy. So we... Haven't been able to book any guests, honestly. <laughs> but yeah, so we are back. We're excited to be back. Thank you all for your patience. And we've got a um, good guest list of uh, upcoming guests coming on soon. So now that we're back, we're back for good for quite a while now. And so, Well, I mean, you say that and Christmas is coming. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Yeah, we'll probably take a holiday break. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we will have some filmed to... Uh, to, to hold you guys over but uh chris talk to us about uh who we interviewed today and what we talked about well we interviewed oh my goodness why okay sorry my you not remember who we out. interviewed no <laughs> we interviewed james me you have a concussion john too? micros <laughs> from from cutlass cutlass is back it's mm -hmm. super sick to have them. If you guys haven't heard their first single they put out recently, Words of Fire, go and do so right after you hear this podcast because it's pretty rocking. It's awesome. And, and you will have just heard it as soon as this podcast began as well. Right, right. Because we're going to use that one and not the other one that we talk about. Okay. We talk about a new song. Get it together, Chris. <laughs> that is absolutely We've been amazing. gone a while. We have. We're a bit rusty. Wow. I haven't even been making videos recently, but <laughs> that'll change. <laughs> uh, yeah, awesome stuff coming from Cutlass, music-wise. Uh, and also, they have a new podcast out called Rock in a Hard Place. It's uh, super good. I've listened to the first four episodes now. Just awesome getting to know those guys via that. Um, and then now being able to chat with them like this was like, super cool experience actually <laughs> but uh, we had a great conversation and uh yeah what else did we talk about sean future plans for the band what they did during hiatus and a little bit about their musical journeys and their upbringings it was a really great interview uh real quick before we get into the interview i wanted to highlight that we have been saving all the patreon money that you guys that our very generous patrons have uh have been donating over the last year and a half and if you guys can't tell, Chris and I got new webcams with that money. So um, thank you guys so much for um, for contributing. Yes. We still have a little bit left over that we're going to buy for little minor things here and there to tweak it. But um, we're hoping to greatly increase the um, the visual appeal of this podcast. So if you guys are listening right now, feel free to go on YouTube, go on For The Rock's channel and uh, watch this interview. Hopefully we look a lot better. I mean, I can't say much about Sean's face, but we try. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> totally good. <kidding. laughs> um, but yes, thank you guys so much for your support and continued support for those of you who've still been doing, like supporting our Patreon, even though we've been gone for so long. Mm -hmm. It means a lot. And uh, yes, as Sean said, we'll, we are back. We'll, we've got a lot of cool stuff lined up. So with that, here is our interview with Cutlass. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, we're excited to have you all. Yeah. Welcome back to the scene. Um, would you guys mind introducing yourselves for those listening real quick? Yeah, uh, I'm John Micah. I'm the singer for Cutlass. Hey, what's up? This is James. I play guitar for the band Cutlass. Sweet. Thanks, guys. And uh, so you guys yep. just came back out from hiatus isn't that correct or was it was it like an official hiatus or was it just kind of like took some time <laughs> off from the band tell us what you guys have been up to it, yes and no yeah <laughs> yes and no it was it was an, a, an unofficial official hiatus okay 
<laughs> it was, yeah, it was not by choice at first. And then, you know, uh, yeah. So I guess for the last five or six years to our, our dear fan base, who, by the way, we love you all so much. We're so thankful for you. Uh, but over the last five or six years to our fan base, it probably seemed like we just kind of disappeared without any explanation. Um, you know, we can't really like go into all the details of it just from legality sake, but honestly we had like a bad business deal and we were, um, essentially sidelined by, uh, some problems with a production and a touring company that, um, kind of canceled a whole tour on us and we lost a lot of money from it. And, um, it culminated with, you know, a, a lot of other experiences over the years that had just kind of built up and built up and we just really needed a break. I think, um, it has not been necessarily a completely restful break. Uh, we didn't like step away to try and like find ourselves, but that's kind of what happened anyway. Yeah. And in the midst of that, there was this thing called COVID that also right. kind of, it wasn't great for touring. Um, <laughs> Ruined all and, your comeback bands. plans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was honestly for us, it was kind of a godsend that we had already started doing some other things at that point, And we weren't 100% reliant upon mm. um, tour. Because I mean, in, throughout our career, our tour, touring has been how we made a living, right. honestly. Like, yeah. I know that most artists would love to make their living just from recording. Um, but the reality is, is that usually doesn't work out. You're always recouping, y you know, there's the bulk of your, what you survive on comes from touring, which is why everyone tours so hard and why we were mm -hmm. gone, um, just crazy amounts of the year. Um, and, and that kind of, that also led to some of the burnout, right? When you're, when you're gone 200, 250 days a year, um, and you have a family and, you know, wife and kids and they've got all their stuff going on. And, um, it was, it was hard. I, it was interesting cause I went from just kind of like to put it into perspective. I went from maybe making it to two of my son's soccer games in a season to making it to all of his soccer games, except for two, um, wow. <laughs> you know, and just cause we weren't on the road anymore. And, um, I picked up a job. I worked at a church for a little while. Um, and then kind of was back and forth and in between. We had a season there where we were doing a few shows, um, doing some recording and things like that. Uh, back the the last record that we that we did, yeah, in Alpha Omega. So that was twenty seventeen. Seventeen, mm -hmm. yeah. So I was kind of back and forth between working at a church there and still doing some cutlass stuff, and then really kind of like twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen um, was when we really went dark. Did very very few shows. Uh, we had a few here and there, um, and I started working for uh, medical sales. I worked as a medical sales rep for Stryker, um, and so I spent really the last three years until this last summer, um, I was working for Stryker, and that was that was my main job. And uh, right. it was weird going from doing Cutlass for the last 20 years to yeah. working for a Fortune 500 company <laughs> as a sales rep. Yeah. And uh, it was, yeah, it was just a crazy dynamic but it provided for my family through that whole season we had good health insurance and steady income and that was uh definitely a godsend during the covid season and allowed yeah. me to step away from music and honestly even the christian um i mean my whole life i've been in kind of the professional Local. christian space right like yeah. i grew up my dad was a pastor grew up in the mm -hmm. church my first few jobs were all kind of working for the church or church related things. We did cutlass. It was all, you know, you're still in that kind of vocational Christian space. Um, and so striker was really my first opportunity to be completely out of that, where my morality, my beliefs on God, all of those things had zero to do with my source of income. <laughs> And so that was actually really healthy for me and really refreshing to be able to be in a space where I could actually, you know, be myself and think about the things that like, okay, am I doing this because I want to do this or because I feel like I have to do this? Is this something that I believe in is right and that's why I'm doing it? Or do I not feel like I have a choice? And I realized for much of my life, 
I didn't, I didn't feel like I had a choice, honestly. Like you just do what's expected of you and that's just what you do. Cause that's <laughs> the social norms that are expected. Right. And so yeah. that, that part of it for me was really freeing then to be able to be like, wait, okay, how do I want to live? And why do I want to live that way? And not have all these external pressures on top of that dictating that. And that's where I think when James says, you know, finding ourselves who are healing from some of the hurts of the church, some of the hurts from the Christian music industry, some of the hurts from the pressures we felt over the years, and we're able to kind of step away and go, okay, what do we want and who are we? And, you know, without all of this stuff and how do we want to live our lives and, and what's, what's real here and what's not. And I think the hurts kind of drove us to that point. And, um, it was a very hard season. Um, but also I think of really important and pivotal season in our lives and our yeah. ministry and our career. Yeah. And we both started doing therapy too. We both started going to therapists and talking about our trauma and, you know, I, I had a pretty gnarly childhood, so I had never really gone to a counselor, never tried therapy before. And there were all sorts of things that were making me feel like I was a failure and I was a disappointment to everybody and like um, people were going to reject me and walk out of my life. And it just, it really put me in some pretty dark places. I was having a couple panic attacks every week for like over a year and, you know, just this overwhelming sense of anxiety and, uh, you know, it get it, like jokingly we found ourselves, but like, really like we were putting in the work over the last few years. And as a result, now that we are making new music, honestly, I feel like I'm full of songs. I feel like I've so much to talk about. <laughs> so, um, and you guys got some grit. Helpful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. Well, when, when we decided, when we decided to start doing music again, we were like, okay, if we're going to do this, we're, we're going to do it the way we want to do it. Like, Again, so much of our career was wrapped in this, what we need to do, what we're supposed to do. How are we going to, I mean, yeah, how are we going to survive says, next year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What everyone says will be successful. Okay. What does that sound like? What does that look like? What does that mean? You know? Cause you and live and die just, on a radio yeah. single. Yeah. yeah. I mean, your whole career and our career is an example of that. Honestly, if it wasn't for strong tower and what faith can do, we would not have seen the success that we've seen in our career. And yet, like that's what now we're like, ah, oh, shoot. Well, that's what we're known for, but we've always been a rock band. What we've always wanted to do was rock, mm -hmm. but we needed those songs. We needed that side to kind of have that larger cross platform mm -hmm. success and opportunity so that we could make a living out of music. I mean, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, we can put out music that we love and if nobody listens to it, we're not doing this very long. Um, and so this time around, we just said, you know what we're going to, we've, we've done, done it all we've done the rock we've done the the you know ac radio we've we've kind of done all of that and if we're going to keep doing this at this point we don't have the energy to fight that battle anymore like we just want to do what we want to do and and that's how we're going to operate and we're not going to live in fear and and we're probably going to have to be creative about how we make a living over the next season and we're working on that right now as well we've got a lot of irons in the fire there <laughs> um yeah but for this season, we just go, we got to be genuine to what, what we want to do and what we feel strongly we should do and not kind of live in fear of like, well, what if we don't get a radio single? Then what we go, mm. who cares if we don't get a radio single? We're going <laughs> to, we're going to do, we're going to make the music that we need to be making right now. Amen. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I think that opens up to where with you guys like obviously you guys have been quote unquote heavy or hard rock like ever since the beginning and you've yeah. kind of had up and downs of that throughout but just the teasers we've gotten of the new stuff like with how much it is in that vein you have a whole new generation of people and or just the people that are only into the heavier stuff hearing these new songs and that'll be like a whole new Bang yeah, that you know, there's hear all your older stuff. There's a lot of different factors at play for like um, what is happening with this new music and the potential for new audiences and stuff. Um, some of those things are like this. Um, 
you know, we have been a band for 20 years. So now like our original fan base, a lot of them have kids too (laughs) and want to show them, oh, dude, this band Cutlass, I totally grew up listening to Cutlass. You got to hear these new songs. It's like rock again. This was the, this was the band. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're kind of reaching that age in our career now where a lot of people come up to us and say like, you guys were the first Christian rock band that I heard, like the first band that got me into it, you know, that's me. You hear that a lot. So, oh, sweet. Thank you. That's rad. So, you know, that's exciting. So that's one group there. We got the, the OG Cutlass fans, um, and their kids now. Um, number two, Spotify wasn't really as, uh, efficient and as direct to customer, (laughs) so to speak, uh, five years ago, six years ago, when we kind of like started this hiatus and now like we can release music straight to an audience that's like already, you know, subscribed to our channel and they Mm -hmm. get notifications when we get new music out. And like, there's, there's ways for our new songs to get added to different playlists. Like we're on all these like metal playlists and stuff now, which is so dope. Like a Slipknot and then a Cutlass song, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's amazing. amazing. James's childhood so, dream is coming true. <laughs> Slipknot and Cutlass in the I same just playlist. Gotta say on Kingdom Core podcast, I've been this guy the whole time. Just so you know, <laughs> this is the music I've always wanted to write. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. yeah. And and I think um sonically uh we are looking to continue to evolve and change um so that we don't we don't want to be the band from 20 years ago just, you know, rehashing that same sound mm-hmm. necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um so we do have some stuff in in the works right now that I'm really excited about in infusing some mod- really modern elements of pop and hip hop with metal. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And and something that not a, I don't I haven't heard a lot of bands doing it. There's some that are kind of touching on it. I feel like um, you know I, I know like James and I've talked about bands like Bad Omens or uh, uh, Bring Me the Horizon and some of these some of these like heavy bands that have really like hooky catchy poppy melodies. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I I'm I don't know. I think we've got some cool things coming as we continue to work on these songs um yeah but the the biggest thing being when you kind of remove the rules of like what does this need to be and we just make what we want it to be um it it can be it can be really fun to see where that creative process goes and there's no like oh that's to this it's like well it sounds cool i like it so let's keep it (laughs) cutless trap metal album confirmed yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) that would be sick <laughs> oh, and and by the way, when he says hip hop as an influence, um, I want to just clarify. And and this is the kind of Yo. podcast where we can get, <laughs> this is the kind of podcast where we can get into the weeds about this kind of music. Oh, but yeah. um, that that doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna like have rap on the songs. But what it does mean it's is new metal, uh, right? Like, hey, maybe if yeah, we're feeling yeah. it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A pack of chainsaw, okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, We're so, bringing Limp Bizkit back. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what, what, you know, I honestly have been a long-time hip-hop fan. Like, I grew up on the East Coast, and hip-hop kind of came to light from New York City, and I've always been into underground hip-hop, and in the skate scene, you know, Wu-Tang and Nas were like huge when skate videos first started to get made in the late eighties, early nineties. So I've always loved hip hop. And to me, the influence comes through with like beat production for like drum loops and samples and stuff. Like at the end of words of fire, it like goes into that like drum loop sample that like Mm kind of hits for a few measures. And I really love stuff like that as like outros with hard rock music. And also, sometimes I'll listen to um, rappers and get really um, inspired by the rhythm and cadence of their verses and like the way they say a line, like a rapper named Denzel Curry, for instance, the way he spits rhymes when he's like recording songs, sometimes those rhythms to me, I'll like repeat that rhythm and a guitar riff, like Mm -hmm. I'll use the rhythm of what was said. Um, so that, that kind of stuff, like 
I'm always listening to all this different kinds of music, you know, metal, hard rock, rap, but I also grew up loving like Paul Simon and Bonnie Raitt Mm -hmm. and like classical music. I grew up playing all sorts of classical music and, and stuff like that. I'm trying to absorb all of it and funnel it back out as a songwriter uh, with this new kind of music. Yeah. You definitely hear that on words of fire. I think um, yeah. it sounds like the old cut list, but also new with new added elements. So I really love that about the Sweet. song. Um, James, I wanted to ask you, you talked yeah, about like how you've always been this guy when you mentioned Slipknot. I'd love to hear how both you and John Micah got into music, your musical journey and how you guys met and formed Cutlass together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, listeners on this podcast should know that John Micah and I also started a podcast recently. It's called Rock in a Hard Place. And we it's have good. been. It's good. Sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Yeah. Stop listening to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, Chris. You no, can, no, no, no. This isn't. This isn't. <laughs> It's not mutually exclusive. You can listen to more than one podcast. <laughs> this is what drive time in the car is for. When you finish That's one right. podcast, yeah. you start the there other you one. Go. That's right. So what what I was going to say was, um, you know, episode one on Rock in a Hard Place, we talked about like when Cutlass got discovered, which was September 11th, 2001, the day that that tragedy happened. Um, that was the day that we also got discovered and um, started our career, essentially. Um, but we've also been recording episodes lately that talk about like our childhood background stories and how we got into music. But for me, um, John, Micah and I both started playing music at pretty young ages. And both of us started with like, I think maybe you started with piano and then moved to cello, John Micah. But I started with violin and then viola and then cello. And then when I was in sixth grade, my grandpa taught me trumpet and gave me his trumpet. He was a trumpet player. And um, I grew up obsessed with like John Williams and Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard. And I wanted to write scores for movies when I was an adult. So like, you know, like Alien, like I love that movie and like E.T. and like all these awesome like sci-fi fantasy kind of movies that had great musical scores. So I really tried to learn as many of the instruments as I could. And I started playing guitar at age 12, literally just because I wanted to like have a break from having all these music lessons and trying to learn all these different instruments. And I just wanted to like rock. I wanted to like sit in my room and play along with Metallica or Smashing Pumpkins. And I just like taught myself by ear, basically. Um, so I was like 12 when I picked up guitar. I think John Micah started around that time too with guitar, but entirely different reason. I just learned this yeah. story the other day, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's what's funny is like all of these stories we actually, in our podcast, like we spent an hour talking about like the start of the band and that 9-11 story. And so it goes it goes in depth and there's a lot of details there that for the sake of time are kind of impossible to share unless you guys want to be here for like three hours. Um, <laughs> we'll split it into two yeah, episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's, uh, we, you know, there's a lot more there if you guys want to go more in, in depth, but for me, yeah. um, I started uh, classical piano when I was five years old and just started kind of learn how to read music and did the whole classical route started taking piano lessons doing recitals all that kind of stuff by the way he's amazing at piano he can sit down and just improvise stuff and i'm just like Pfft. it's like i <laughs> I, I, I have love... one of those friends it's yeah. mind-boggling you're just yeah. like how do you not just make a billion songs and release them and he's like he's never recorded anything and i'm like dude well, like, yeah. people are well, so just sit down and he's just like <laughs> It's like, why I can't do that. I wish I could do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually, that. at one point, I recorded like two or three piano songs just at my house for fun of just melodies I had in my head. And I mm-hmm. was dinking around and recorded them. And they're just sitting on a hard drive somewhere. I <laughs> never, you know. <laughs> and those are like know. the next hit Cutlass. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you wanted a radio <laughs> single. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you do with like a, with an instrumental piano song? Sell it to you like you sing over it. Sing over it. <laughs> well, okay, oh, yeah. or to, sing over it. Since, since we're it in the weeds already, here's the problem: is if the 
if the for all you music people out there if the piano is already carrying the melody then you put a vocal melody over the top of it and they're conflicting so mm. it, it doesn't work so you have to change the piano part Mm -hmm. to not carry the melody so the vocals can carry the melody and then the piano can support the melody so thus the dilemma <laughs> <laughs> of these were songs that were intended for the piano to carry the melody and the, it does you know so there is a mel strong melody there so anyways yeah, somewhere maybe somewhere along the road we'll just well now with spotify and stuff too i could just put them out honestly i could yeah, just, dude, just yeah and you have your solo it. stuff right yeah, yeah i should just be like here's my instrumental record yeah you should just you here's you my should reggae just record it. <laughs> no. you should upload and it like to like <laughs> three billion streams <laughs> that's probably what'll happen is we'll put something out that we're like totally just goofing around no with and it'll yeah, yeah and it'll blow up and we'll be like are you serious <laughs> yeah. so it's like the viral videos that are terrible content and they get a gazillion hits exactly and insta famous yeah yeah all right uh, so back on so yeah, track so anyways playing piano <laughs> we are great at it yeah chasing all the squirrels um <laughs> so the uh i i started out piano um picked up cello when i was uh, I believe third grade, I think, and just did the orchestra thing uh, with that. Um, when I was in middle school, I think I was about 12 or 13. Um, I broke my hand and I couldn't play the piano, but I could hold a guitar pick still because uh, these, these, uh, the index and thumb finger, I could still hold a pick. And so I learned, I was like, Hey, I can't play piano. So maybe I'll learn guitar. <laughs> uh, and I had a, I had a, there was a pastor at our church that taught me a few chords and, um, that was the beginning of learning how to play the guitar. Uh, and then, and you joined uh, the, the little Levites. <laughs> <laughs> so that was actually piano still. It, oh, okay. was, yeah. Cause that was, I think I was fifth grade. <laughs> Those, oh man. I, I think that the was band... also a Sorry reference. Sorry if you were trying to keep that away from the <laughs> That was also a reference to our podcast. Yeah. Yes. So what you don't know, in, yeah, because we talked about it in our podcast, and now there's been an ongoing text trail between our band members about the Little Levites band merchandise. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point in the future, there might be like a limited release inside joke, Little yeah. Levites band merch. <laughs> yeah. Sure. All by. Uh, yeah, <laughs> nice. Sarah CD, I can buy it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I said we'd only do it if we relaunched the side project of the Little Levites. So, yeah, um, yeah. So there may we're be... all going to trade <laughs> instruments. Everyone pass your instrument to nice. the person on your left. <laughs> we're now the Little uh, Levites. <laughs> so yeah, that that was like fifth or sixth grade, uh, and then yeah. So mi like middle school, I'm playing guitar, and uh, ended up basically like a bunch of the youth group trips they didn't have anybody to do worship and so uh like there was this there was this group called maranatha mountain ministries uh, at my church that they did like skiing and snowboarding trips whitewater kayaking rock climbing mountain biking all stuff that i love to do and they needed someone to do worship and they were like hey if you can cover the worship on the trips you won't have to pay to go on the trip we'll just bring you along and i was like Oh sweet! I'll I'm on all of them. <laughs> I'll lead worship for all of them, and so I ended up leading worship quite a bit on guitar for for those, and that really kind of got me, you know, moving along, mm -hmm. um, and and just getting to go on those trips and play music and stuff. Kind of on the worship leading side, I, I'd say that's where I kind of cut my teeth. Uh, when I was 13, I wrote my first song on piano. Um, my dad and I went to Israel, and he'd written uh, kind of this poem. Uh, one morning while we were like watching the sunrise on the sea of Galilee and, and, uh, and I took that and put it to music. And so that was kind of the first time that I'd ever wow. written something that was our, you know, my own took those, those words and those lyrics and put it to music. And then from there started to write some of my own just material. And that just kind of sat in my back pocket. It was just something I did for me, uh, mm -hmm. to kind of express myself, I guess, and, um, something I enjoyed doing. And so, there's a handful of songs over the years that just sort of happened. And a few of those songs ended up making it on our first record. Um, probably the most notable example, the song Grace and Love uh, on our first record, which is piano based, uh, is because I wrote that song when I was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one that we decided to to pull in and, and add to that record. So That's right. There it is. Oh, there it is. First record right there. 
<laughs> the OG Cutlass record, self-titled. <laughs> that would sure be nice on vinyl. <laughs> this is with cracks and all. Um, this was actually like not the first CD that I ever had, but mm. it was like the first CD that I made the decision to get as like my own CD. Like my mom gave me yeah. um, uh, at the local Christian bookstore. It was, you get the stickers and it says like buy five and you get the uh, one for free. Yeah. And so she gave me some stickers and I went to the shelf and I saw, I saw this album and this was like 2007. And okay. I was oh, like, wow. I think I heard, I seen that cover on christianrock.net and I remember <laughs> liking it. So I guess I'll get it. <laughs> and, awesome. Uh, that's cool. with you guys ever since, so it had so. it had been out a few years at that point yeah yeah i i only got into music in 2007 and it okay. was it was the whole uh it was reliant k first cool and then it was like skillet thousand foot crutch red yeah. and then probably you guys it was awesome. probably the order cool. of discovery <laughs> awesome Very cool. how how large did your cd collection get at its at its largest point I still have them all. Um, <laughs> most of them are in storage because I'm currently living with my wife's grandparents and we have a very small living space now. But uh, I think I'm at probably like seven or eight hundred. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, awesome. Uh, yeah, it's it's I still buy them. Our, our, wow. Well, one that's a week awesome. or one wow. every two weeks on average. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. There's one sitting in the closet that I know my wife got me for Christmas, <laughs> but I already know what it is because <laughs> I was there when she bought it. I don't nice. think I don't think our latest stuff. Is, we don't even have a physical version of it right now. That's crazy. Wait, so. uh, Alpha and Omega had a CD, did not? Yeah, that one did. Yeah, Alpha. Omega okay. Did, oh, but yeah. you're the wait, newest what's, stuff. We don't. What's have newer than that? Well, just uh, twenty. The twenty EP. Oh, the twenty. Then, okay, yeah, 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 and then uh, Words of Fire single, and then. The, but the there's an album single. coming up, right? <laughs> We're, ooh, are we ready Maybe. to break that news Maybe. here on Kingdom Core Podcast? <laughs> Let, let's um, wait a few well, minutes because John was still what, finishing up how he got into music. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. we'll, we'll return oh, yeah. to this. <laughs> there, there we go again. I think I, I was pretty much there. I yeah, we uh, I was playing guitar through mm-hmm. high school. And then college is uh, when the band started. So basically, Sweet. we carried that right into right into college, and we were we started out. Um, I remember I was I was actually playing my guitar in my dorm room at school, and I was I went to college on a soccer scholarship, so I I was soccer was like my focus <laughs> at that time. And uh, but we moved into the dorms early because we had to do training like through August and everything. We were already moved in, and so when everybody else was moving into the dorms, uh, I was just sitting there playing my guitar and singing songs. And next thing I knew, I had like fifteen guys sitting in my dorm room. And everyone's like, Hot. "Oh, can you can you play this song?" <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, not like that, James. <laughs> no, I meant that's a lot of people oh, in one room. Yes, that must it have was been a really hot. Yeah, it was yeah. really yeah. hot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah I don't know. Two guys have AC. <laughs> they don't. The dorms don't know, didn't definitely. have AC. Uh, yeah, so ended up just everyone was requesting songs, and it was like this impromptu song session. It was it was kind of funny, and the uh, the RA of the of the dorm walks in and he's like, man, what's going on in here? And, uh, after kind of everyone dispersed, he just was like, Hey, you obviously know how to play music and can play songs. He said, I- I've been looking to put together this worship night on campus. Would you be willing to lead it? And I was like, sure, I guess like I've, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I guess I've done a lot of that. So yeah, why not? And so he reached out to a couple other guys, found some other guys in the dorms that played other instruments and, we threw together a little worship band um, for, I think it was like Thursday nights or something like that at our school, just our chapel. We started playing music together. And that was the the initial kind of meeting of most of the primary band members. Um, we were just doing worship together. And then from that, started to do some original music and songs. And then James joined us uh, shortly thereafter. And then we started doing local concerts and um yeah, the rest is history. We <laughs> signed a record deal and went on the road. <laughs> yeah. And That's the abbreviated later. version, yeah. That's awesome. Still here. That's so cool. So I guess we can go back to that side tangent we were going to go on as the main subject now. Mm. New music slash new record, question mark? 
Mm-hmm. Yes. What can you guys well, tell us about that? Uh, as as of now, uh, so tomorrow is Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody! I don't know when this episode's going to air, but tomorrow is Thanksgiving, and the following Monday, I am going to be flying to Nashville to stay with Josiah Prince, who Ooh. we have been working with. Uh, producing these songs and that makes so much sense now <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah josiah is great and and dude we are like it's like we share a brain when we work together we work together so fast and i just i love working with him and we've been buddies for years and years but now getting to collaborate on producing these songs together um has been really fun so yeah next week i'm going to be flying to nashville to record more of the songs uh we're going to start working on three that are probably about 80 percent finished right now and one that john micah wrote uh like a week and a half ago or two weeks ago and sent to us and we're gonna work on those four songs next week and then we have more um more time on the calendar in like january uh that we're gonna work on a handful more songs and so yes the goal is we are working our way towards recording a new album which will come out next year we do not so, have a release date in mind yet we're we're still in like the beginning stages not necessarily the beginning stages because i've already written like 20 songs to be honest <laughs> but um the the ones that are in the workshop already you know we're we're going to try and push those across the finish line next week. Yeah. Sweet. But if you don't want to wait that long, uh, there is oh, a yeah. song getting released on December 3rd, our next, uh, December treat. 2nd or December Sweet. 2nd. Sorry. Yeah. We have a show on December 3rd and I keep getting confused, <laughs> on which is, which is happening on which day. Yeah. Um, so December 2nd, um, it's called end of the world. It is. And it is, and um, it's- Heavy. Very it's heavy. heavy. <laughs> it's really good. Sean, this was, Sean and Chris have both heard it. Oh, yes. I heard it like 30 minutes before we started. This. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's still fresh I, on your mind? Okay, yeah. we'll give the listeners your fresh take. Go. Um, Very chonky guitars. Uh, uh, I'm playing a seven string can now. I, can I, is there any sort of uh, non disclosure thing about who's in it? Um, I'll it? just I'll edit it out later. Things in. Oh, <laughs> but I'm the editor. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, uh, Kevin. Kevin from Disciple, uh, yep. who is also one of our very good friends from yep. many many years. We've toured together for years. Is featured on the rec- on the song. Um, yep. Guest vocalist on the bridge. Yeah. He he does what Kevin does, and it sounds amazing. Yeah, it sounds yeah. fantastic. Uh, I I had no idea, and Sean was sitting here. We were we were just kind of doing our pre chat, and he I'm listening, and he's just like, I just go like, wait, what? Kevin's in it, and he's just laughing like he's like, you didn't know that? I'm like, no, it, it's it, awesome. It came in, it hit hard. It's, it's yeah. I need to listen to it again, but it me being a metal fan and always having enjoyed your guys's older like the hard rock kind of stuff probably one of my favorite cutlass songs yes i Radical. will say that it is so. everything that an og cutlass fan wants from the new cutlass <laughs> and <laughs> and more <laughs> yes nice but, but yeah no it was sick technically it is heavier than anything we've ever put out I would as agree. far as like guitars that are tuned James, what were what, what were you? It's drop like drop a flat. Yeah, drop, yeah, drop, drop a, flat. a flat. I'm playing. I'm playing seven string a lot lately. I've just been kind of messing around with that kind of stuff. And yeah, so this song is in drop a flat or G sharp if you're fancy. And um, yeah, there's. It's nearly six minutes long. It's called "End of the World," and I think it lives up to the title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would say I, which so. literally to me i wanted this to sound like the apocalypse was happening <laughs> that was the goal yeah which again when we talk about no rules when's the last time you heard a band put out a six minute long song right like That's in true. recent memory yeah because especially most- like a hard rock band like 
I mean, it's pretty band common in like, on worship. Doom yeah, core. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, I mean, 30 years ago, bands did that all the time. Six minute long songs were not uncommon. Yeah. Nowadays, if a song's oh. over three and a half minutes, it's like, this thing's so long. <laughs> and, and it's so again, that was just another space where, you know, things like that, where you, we're not going, ah, this really needs to be under four minutes because that's the listener's listening, you know, span. And this is, you know, for a song to, be in the right format it needs to be this long it was like no just mm. make the song what it needs to be to convey what it needs to convey and if it's yeah. six minutes then then great then it's six minutes <laughs> mm -hmm. so james tell them about the intro too it's kind of okay. kind of interesting the yeah, sounds so, and stuff yeah so i referenced earlier that i was really inspired by like movies and you know movie scores growing up and uh, specifically like alien is one of my favorite movies. I think the score is incredible. I think the way it's directed looks incredible. So as I was writing this song, end of the world, I was thinking of it like a movie kind of. And so the beginning of the song is, um, it has sort of like a long sort of theatrical intro. And the beginning of the song is actually a recording of the electromagnetic tone of earth from outer space as recorded by nasa each of the planets emits their own tone each planet has its own note which i find very yeah, beautiful who's the nerd now <laughs> yeah. it's definitely me I was, I was hiding behind that um so yeah the song starts off with that sound of earth from outer space and you kind of hear these like kind of these tension chords and you hear like sort of the sounds of chaos on earth and then there's these seven huge trumpet blasts basically um and you hear kind of the riff of the song start halfway through these trumpet blasts but yeah after the seventh trumpet when the song kicks in that's like essentially that's the apocalypse starting and then we made the the lyrical focus um you know i really wanted it to speak to kind of the apathy of um not just the church but like mankind towards the hurt the hurting people around the world and you know um it's it's also an evangelistic plea the song it it calls you to really consider like are you listening are you are you ready to make this decision you know there's kind of a tongue-in-cheek almost video game sort of part where it says choose your fighter uh in the right before kevin comes in um which is actually my voice by the way um <laughs> And, and, it wasn't and, a and Kevin was the fighter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And he so chose I, Kevin as his yeah. fighter. <laughs> yeah. I got Kevin, yeah. I it was tag you. teamed. I tagged I tagged Kevin in. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I was just trying to be playful and it's inspired by like Revelation six through eleven, like those five chapters, you know. And um yeah, it's just uh it's a fun song. I wanted it to be as heavy as we could make it without actually changing our genre because <laughs> we're not a metal band i don't necessarily want john micah to go into like Roar, scream rah, rah, scream rah, rah, vocals rah, rah, for all of the verses <laughs> i i want us to have poppy hooky choruses you know so but, but that's what metal core is <laughs> right sure <laughs> i i mean i don't know is this the first metal core cutlass song technically it it's got Order elements line. of it for sure. <laughs> yeah. Just don't, it's, you just can't label us, you know, we're just, no. <laughs> right. John um, Micah, I mean, have you ever tried to scream? It just is heavy. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. screams I a mean, lot. There's I, a ton I, of I mean, I, okay, in, sorry, sorry. I, obviously, the old, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there's tons I, of songs I, in the like, catalog where he screams. Like a, like a low growl kind of screaming, like a, yeah. You know, I've 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 dabbled. Um I don't think it's my strength. I I think I kind of I think I can do it, but it's it has to be kind of like a cupped microphone, more uh, soft yeah. whispery. James is shaking his head no. 
<laughs> Here's the thing. No, no, no. I, d- I don't want that to happen. We're not that band. Also, yeah. have you heard him sing? That's He's true. got an amazing yeah. voice. He's got the voice why would of an angel. Tr- so yeah. Why would we try and hide that? You know what I mean? <laughs> Metal and, with and, an angelic voice. That's, that's what we're <laughs> shooting for. <laughs> I, what I really want to try and achieve on these new songs is like just really catchy, like poppy stuff that's not cheesy but like produced like metal Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. big guitars i i am obsessed with rhythms so there's going to be fun rhythmic sections with breakdowns and there's going to be all this kind of theatrical stuff there's lots of synth layers and all that flying around but he's got an incredible voice i don't want him to do that style of uh, screaming um yeah. we do you know like in words of fire we build up to that scream in the bridge and that's really more our style we kind of do build-ups that emphasize those like big scream mm-hmm. moments and stuff but i don't want him to do that other style <laughs> I, he's a great singer yeah yeah absolutely. and i think i think it also is reflective of our musical influences right like some of our favorite bands are bands like the foo fighters you know which is a great rock band um, they're not a heavy metal screamo screaming band, you know, that's, and I think that's where I I've always loved nineties rock too, like pop rock, you know, Goo Goo Dolls and third eye blind mm. and vertical horizon. And I, I grew up with a lot of that kind of music and, and I think it influences some of my stuff, melodies and singing stuff, you know? Um, and so I, and I, I don't know, I think there's something really cool about when you confuse some of these elements mm-hmm. and that's what we were talking about of even hip-hop beats or elements that that kind of get fused in and um you know i think when lincoln park came out they were kind of the first band to kind of bring some hip-hop influence into like a heavy band and it blew people's minds they were just mm-hmm. like what is yeah, this? without being like rap rock right yeah yeah, yeah. and it was just kind of this new fusion that was obviously a lot of people liked it because it did really, really well. Yes. And uh, and so I think sometimes if you can fuse elements from different genres of music well, uh, it can be really, really powerful. Um, but done wrong can be terrible. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a very delicate line. But I would say that also with just music in general, that oftentimes the simplest thing is the most beautiful or the most amazing thing and the hardest to do Mm -hmm. simple done well is so hard to do because otherwise it's just simple but if it's simple and it's memorable you've just done something that is like so hard it's so hard to capture that and that i think bands like the beatles were like kind of the pinnacle of that a lot of the beatles most well-known or you know their biggest songs a lot of them are pretty simple but they're so memorable Mm -hmm. and so iconic and they had some of their more experimental records and things where they got you know a bit more artistic and a bit busier in in the things that they were doing but you know uh i mean just go on youtube and and you can find anybody playing drums or guitar that's just like shredding the whole time and you're like wow that's really impressive and i'm sick of listening to it in (laughs) 10 seconds exactly (laughs) you know and then you find someone that's just plays uh there's there's a few people that do cover songs on on youtube that they just it's just them and a guitar or just them and a piano or something and they capture a moment and it's super simple but it's just amazing and it's captivating and draws you in and you're you're like how what did they do how did they do that i've heard that song before Mm -hmm. why is this so special and i think that is where like something with music it's so hard to capture that but when you capture it simplicity done well is genius um but it's really hard to do and so i think that's something we're always searching for yeah it's brave because i think people try and overplay to cover up like their lack of confidence in dynamics and space Mm. you know space in music is really important dynamics is really important um i always try and approach every song i'm writing with not only uh, a melody and lyric hook that is sung but also a guitar hook. I want every time someone hears a Cutlass song with like, especially this new music that's like pushing into the hard rock realm. I want you to have one of the riffs stuck in your head too. Not just the song, the words, the the melody, the chorus or whatever. I want you to have that guitar riff in mind and be able to sing it to your friend. Oh, you know, 
the dun 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 dun, which is you know <laughs> the audience hasn't heard it yet, but that's in end of the world. The like, new riff that like the riff for me was. That's all you guys oh, are gonna yeah. get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know that yeah. that as a songwriter and the two of us especially like we do have pretty wide wide cast nets as far as our influences go and i want to absorb all of that and put it back out yeah mm-hmm. i mean honestly right now uh and this is very unmetal of me to say but i'm listening to a lot of like la produced pop stuff they're really smooth um but intentionally to listen to vocal melodies and rhythms and things that i go ooh, i like that wonder what if we were to take some of those elements and put it into a a heavy song mm-hmm. what would yeah. that sound like and and that's Honestly, where my head's too. at k-pop a lot of new stuff <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for real for yeah. real dude there's a few blackpink is a, a female k-pop group and um kda like some of that music is so slick and like i mean it hits hard and they've got really great melodies really well, catchy it's yeah really i was well gonna say produced what pop does better than anyone is catchy melodies. Yeah. Like they have the catchiest melodies. And so I go, well, why can't we put that level of catchy melodies into a heavy song? Like, yeah. w- why, you know, what's wrong with that? And so I think, and again, that's where it's such a delicate balance of y- you, you push it too far one way or the other. And it just, doesn't work and we've run into that there's literally been songs that we attempted to do something like this and we're like yeah that's not working <laughs> that will never see the light of day it's gonna it'll be a little levite song for the future but yeah so sometimes it doesn't work but those those things you know for us i think i would love to push what we're doing into some of these new spaces of things we haven't tried before. And I go, man, I love that melody. I love, I mean, right now, Taylor Swift and her Ticketmaster debacle is like the news story of the week. Right. And I'm going at the same time, here is a girl who did country music who went in and then did pop music. And now she's like the biggest artist on the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you listen to her newest stuff, it's a lot of this kind of smooth LA pop sounds and so it's what's happening in the mainstream world of music, what the general public is consuming and enjoying and liking. And, and I go, there's some cool stuff in there. There's a reason it's mm-hmm. successful. Um, and if we can extract some of those things that I go, man, that's really cool. I love that. What yeah. if we were to use some of those Combine elements? the catchy riffs and produce it yeah. like a, a metal song. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then you come up with something that's fresh because you go, wow, I've never heard a melody like that with guitars like that. Yeah. And it, and it, it gives you, well, I'm going to, I'm going to use an example. Um, there was a burger shop, uh, in Sandy, Oregon. <laughs> Where are you going? With yeah. This? Then, uh, so, is this the right example? So interested. Yeah. <laughs> so they I don't had, know. he has had 30 concussions. Yes, Maybe yes. he's <laughs> off on a weird tangent. <laughs> So, right, so I know, shop. I know this is, I know this is a hard right turn here, but <laughs> it'll make sense. Uh, so it's at, gonna at talk this, about McDonald's in some way. <laughs> no. So McDonald's though, McDonald's, you, you're going to get, you know, meat and cheese and pickles and don't mustard. you dare throw shade at McDonald's and, and it's, and it's yeah. Wait, but me? so this, no, nobody, <laughs> I hate McDonald's. I don't eat McDonald's. It's death. No. Okay. But, go, go, go. Okay. The burger so, shop so anyway, in so this, Sandy, this, Oregon. This burger shop, and I don't even think it's there anymore, but they had all these really weird burgers with all these kind of different that were outside of the box, right? Where you're going, that that sounds terrible. Like, why why would you mix those elements? And there was this one burger, I believe it was called the Tijuana Temptation. And they took all of the best things that I like about Mexican food and they put it into a <laughs> cheeseburger. And I thought Mexican food and a cheeseburger, how did those blend? That's impossible. There's no way. And when I took a bite of that thing, I was like, I love cheeseburgers and I love Mexican food. And I just got all of that in one bite. This is my new favorite burger. I love it. And that was my go-to burger every time I went there. So illustration to say, you can take two mariachi music. (laughs) Somebody get and Taco Bell metal. on the phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> throw some nachos, nachos with cheese and salsa, and uh, throw a burger uh, bun. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, 
So, anyways, fusions. Fusions can can be very great, but when they go wrong, they go very wrong. Mm -hmm. But they can also go very right. So it's funny you say that because uh, there's um, in the town I just moved to. There's a pizza joint just um, like ten minutes down the road, and when you pass by it, they have a big sign advertising their new Mexican pizza or taco pizza. Mm -hmm. So it's just taco ingredients on a pizza, and it looks horrible. So that that would have you tried it though? I have not. I know. See, that's okay. enough to keep me from trying it <laughs> my wife and i recently went to uh this like crazy waffle joint that has like just random different types of waffles and we do um she always likes to get a sweet one and a savory one because they do savory stuff nice and it was waffles Another fusion with sweet and savory pork. with pulled pork Ooh. yeah and it's really good that's like Is a it? thick belgian waffle with pulled pork on it see does it have a yeah. sauce on it too uh trying to think well i know there's like there's a little bit of cheese and then i think they might put a little bit of something on there but just maple like syrup a, it's got to be like a sweet and sour no no no, no syrup <laughs> no and then we got like a sweet one and it was like a banana cream Ooh. thing so it has like slices of banana like the whipped cream all over it and then a little bit of syrup yeah. it's probably not you're good listening us, to but. kingdom core <laughs> a podcast about christian metal <laughs> Oh, you know, waffles. you know what though? To bring Brought it, to you to by bring the it, Food Network. <laughs> to, <laughs> to bring it back to bands that have done this though, I think pretty well. Papa Roach has done some pretty interesting fusions yeah. of styles in their yeah. recent, like, last couple of records. So I think that's another interesting band of a band that's been around a long time that's experimenting with some new Very, dynamic yeah. uh, blends of styles and stuff. And it's, yeah. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, the stuff I've heard of it is it's pretty cool. So. I don't know, but there you go. Just think of waffles and and brisket when you or pork when pork. you hear the new cutlass <laughs> <song. laughs> <laughs> or burgers and it's the end of the food. world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, uh, so this good. song really makes me want a burger with taco meat inside of it. <laughs> Random quick aside. Speaking okay. of music blends and bands and you guys, James, your testimony is like crazy mm-hmm. and sad and amazing and awesome, like coming to Christ and stuff. And when you guys told the story, you were just just kind of told it like the friend group that like the Christian friends that kind of brought you mm-hmm. to youth group and stuff and ended up yeah. being falling up. That's it was right. like crazy to hear that because like. Sean knows and everybody who listens to this podcast knows like falling up is like my favorite band of all time. Oh, sweet. But, um, I love them too, brother. Yeah. So good. Such a, so unique underrated. They are really yes. underrated. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And if you're listening to this episode and you haven't heard the band falling up, which is named after a poem by Shel Silverstein, by the way, uh, go listen to falling up. I think that Dawn escapes is probably the best record. Um, okay. Yeah. I also, yeah, they're really good. You're gonna love it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we're we're all from Albany, Oregon. We grew up together, and uh, from about middle school on, those were my buddies. And you know, we had like science classes together, <laughs> and <laughs> like so awesome. played sports together. And uh, the drummer Josh Shroy was in my band, uh, which was called Custom. Also with a K, I've been in a lot of K. <laughs> that a thing for <laughs> custom <laughs> cutlass. How about that yeah. one? Yeah, <laughs> and um, Josh, I mean, phenomenal drummer. You'll you'll hear that if you listen to Falling Up Records, listener. And um, Josh and I were in a band. Um, and when I came to faith in Jesus, for the first like year or so. You know, I just felt like I was growing in faith and kind of uh, just understanding what I could do with my passion for music and my gifts. And I ended up walking away from being in that band because at the time, um, the five of us in that group didn't really have the same goals in mind spiritually. Um we had lost uh, a dear friend of ours um, who was the first singer of our band Um, as a 19 year old kid, he got in a car accident and was killed. And 
Um, then uh, shortly after that, uh, we kept writing music and then we ended up getting a different singer. And um, that guy was new to all of us. He wasn't from Albany. We hardly knew him at all. But it, to me, it really started to change the dynamic of our band a lot. And he was pretty anti religion, anti Christianity, and not really, um, not really going along with the idea that we should write songs that were faith driven. Um, and honestly, it, it wasn't about that. It was just that the Lord was really leading me on to something else and was preparing, uh, my path to kind of join up with John Micah. And, uh, you know, I think we see where that led over 20 years and we've been able to, you know, be there for each other uh, as great friends and have each other's backs and, um, and also make a lot of great music along the way. But yeah, when I grew up in Albany, Oregon, um, those were some of my friends and integral in leading me to Jesus, um, as well as a friend of mine named Logan Martin, who is like a video producer now lives in San Diego. Um, but yeah, we had a really great thing going on in Albany. There was a great youth group, great preacher named Rob Nelke, um, a lot of kids were coming to faith in Jesus and there was like fun music and there was like a lot of skateboarders and it was just like a lot of fun stuff going on, a really creative group of kids and a really, um, um, a really fun time to, to mm -hmm. be there. Yeah. And we got to take falling up out with us, uh, on, I think it was the hearts of the innocent tour there with us, wasn't it? Yeah. We, on we had them on a couple tours. Um, but yeah, they uh, they were definitely on the Hearts of the Innocent tour, which is um, Cutlass Live from Portland album and DVD uh, were recorded on that tour. Oh, really? I didn't realize oh, that. Cool. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. And they were and they were on that tour with us and Disciple, Disciple oh, wow. and Stellar Cart, right? I think was Stellar Oh man, Cart what a tour! <laughs> if only I wasn't yeah. ten. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to yeah. be innocent, you're so heartedly. <laughs> Yeah, there that was go. that was that really was such a fun tour. I, that we had uh, Suzuki Motor sponsored the tour, so it was pretty cool to have a big oh, wow. you know, Suzuki <laughs> yeah. sponsoring. We got the to tour. give away a car. That's so yeah, cool. Yeah, and and a motorcycle. Yeah, it was pretty neat. <laughs> Too um, bad they didn't film Falling Up live for for the thing, because then we would have had some good live footage of them. Because there's barely yeah. any from that. Time. Oh, really? Yeah. It's all like the early crappy cell phone quality, oh, like crackly, yeah. no, like it's yeah. almost all the live footage. It's just that, like, oh, I want to see them live. Yeah. Oh, man. oh, you never got to see them play? I never got to see them. Oh, I'm Bummer. from Vancouver Island, which I know you guys actually mentioned in your podcast, which is cool. Um, oh, dude, I love there's Victoria like no, so much. No scene around here at all. Yeah. Like, it's I, pretty rare that I get to go anywhere, which I went to Seattle just a few weeks ago, but cool um, gonna take a ferry to get to anything yeah it's long expensive <laughs> you gotta really <laughs> plan yep. it and sacrifice to go anywhere to do anything so yep. um yeah never got to see falling up sadly but i don't think we've ever played a show on vancouver island now's your time God i've been it. there are you, are you guys I've gonna be playing shows times, again though. Ooh, are we breaking that news on this podcast well, too? Oh, so so we're we, <laughs> <laughs> we are we are doing spot dates right now. Okay. Uh, we like like I mentioned, we have a show in Ohio coming up here December third. Um, we were over in Germany uh, last month um, for uh, Loud and Proud Loud Festival and proud. with a whole bunch oh, of nice. whole bunch of other rock bands. That was that was really fun um, just yeah. being over there with everybody. So we are doing some dates. Um, there are rumblings of a tour, maybe possibly a um, lot of lot of details to work out. But um, we're uh, At we're East Vancouver, please. We're we're <laughs> we're gonna do we're gonna do the uh, Vancouver Island tour. Which oh play yes, I'll be every, at like every, every show. <laughs> I'll take a month off work and just travel around. We're gonna we're gonna do a thirty city tour on yeah. Vancouver Island. There are even thirty cities sure. there. You'll, you'll break that like uh, what was it seven person crowd? <laughs> you'll break that record. I hope we're so. Gonna, we're gonna have to invent some cities as we go along. There just you to, go. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, we're talking about it. Cool. Are you still? Are you still? Are you on Vancouver Island right now? As we speak, yes, That's I live in Nanaimo. Okay. Um, Is it rainy so- there and cold? And dark? uh, yeah, <laughs> mostly. And I was actually in Victoria here. today. Like I drive okay. a truck, um, so I took a load of pipe from Nanaimo down to Victoria. Yeah, but yeah, uh, it wasn't rainy today, thankfully. But the last mm. couple of days, yeah, it's hasn't been the funnest to drive yeah. and work outside and all that. Pacific Northwest rain. Yeah. yeah. Standard, but beautiful <laughs> hey, in the summertime. It's now. so it's cold so... right now though. Like it, it, we had snow almost a month ago, three weeks ago. So we had like a small snowfall, which people who live on like the East coast or in the middle, you know, of North America, that's kind of normal. I think some places like at least in Canada, but uh, for us, that's early <laughs> to oh, be that wow. cold. So yeah, it's, uh, we have. I just shoveled my driveway today because we got like, oh, wow. four inches of snow. Oh, so I think what I am I out, complaining about? I was out shoveling <laughs> uh, snow today. So yeah, yeah. You know, I actually love Victoria though. Um, so my wife is a cheer and dance coach for the uh, Oregon City High School. So okay, we have a a huge cheer squad and the band. Um, they travel together a lot and we get invited to come do performances all around the country. And so sometimes I'll go and chaperone and we have actually, um, been invited several times to the Victoria days, Hmm. uh, festival and that parade. And so I've been to Victoria a few times. I love it so much. It's so beautiful. Next time you guys are on the Island. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. It's been a minute since I've been, I I drive there like four times a week. Yeah. And so how far away would, do you live from Victoria? It's about an hour and a half north. If okay. you go the speed limit, which you always do, right? I always yeah. do. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. James does too. Yeah, always. <laughs> Not here, buddy. I know we're we're probably getting close on time mm-hmm. here, but just before we wrap it up, like what was the thing that made you guys want to start your podcast, Rock and Hard Place? Hmm. Hmm. Good question. Yeah. So I I think we haven't really gotten into some of the topics and things that we, I think we're going to camp out on a bit more. Um, Thus far, we've kind of been giving it our history to kind of, so that when we get to those conversations, you know where we've been and where we've come Mm. from a bit more. And so we have a few more episodes to talk about in our own journey of just what's happened with our band over the years. And, and because I think that context is going to be really important moving forward as we start to talk about some of our struggles and things we're dealing with more current day. Um, But in this season, one of the things I think that as we stepped away and then now that we're coming back, at least for me personally, um, I have always felt that, um, the the public space is not a safe space for me to talk about my vulnerabilities and my flaws and my problems and my issues. And what I've seen in the Christian circles predominantly is when that stuff gets exposed, it oftentimes is used against you. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it, it can harm you, it can harm your career, it can harm, you know, if, if we're just, if we're just going to air out and be vulnerable about stuff, um, it, it can be a double-edged sword, Right. But at the same time, when someone talks about their struggles and their their difficulties, there's a whole bunch of people that can relate and basically are like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad he talked about that or shared that because I feel that way or I've been dealing with that or I've been wrestling with that. And I think at this point in our career, as James and I have talked about, even just like musically, we don't want to f- be put in a box that these are the rules and this is what we have to do. From a ministry standpoint, I think we're also trying to step out into a place of we're not going to tote the line either of what's expected within the shiny Christian veneer. Right. Mm -hmm. And and like, I I guess that maybe the most relatable ways, you know, people go to church on Sunday and they shake hands and smile and say hi to everybody. And even if their marriage is a total wreck or they just cussed out their kids on the way to church, once they walk through the doors, they're like, Oh, God bless you. You know, and we all put on our Sunday best and we're like, you know, we high five and then we go back to our, our 
back in the car you know, and it's fighting again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? And so no one ever walks in and goes, yeah, I just cussed out my kids and I really shouldn't have done that. And I'm, I feel pretty bad about that. Um, that's not the conversations that happen. And we've realized there's not a lot of places for those conversations to take place to go. I don't want to be this way. I want to change. I want to be different. You know, and James is even talking about uh, both of us now actually seeing professional therapists and counselors. There has been a stigma within the Christian culture a lot of times that it's like, well, why don't you just have more faith or talk to Jesus about your problems? Because, you know, if you had enough faith, if your relationship with God was good enough, you wouldn't be having these issues. Read your Bible more. The Bible will solve your issues. And it's like, well, actually, if I broke my arm, I'm not going to go to church and ask a pastor to reset my broken bone. Like, the, you know, I, the, I'm going to go see a clinical doctor <laughs> that knows what he's doing yeah. and yeah. he's going to take care of it. And the reality is, is that many of us have. You're not going to get them to pray for it? Though? Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll still have them pray for it. That's fine. But. But a lot of us, I think, actually have real wounds mm. mentally and emotionally that need treated by professionals, by, you know, people that are physicians, that are psychologists, that are psychiatrists, that are therapists, that are that they know what they're doing. They're trained and they're they're um, and, and just like any care, not all doctors are great doctors. Right. There's I've been around. I've seen some doctors that I'm like, I don't think I would ever want you to be my doctor. Um so just because they have an MD behind their name doesn't always mean that they're a great doctor, but there's also some really fantastic doctors that really help people. And so this stigma of like, well, you just need more of God. And I'm like, well, sometimes that's not what I need. Sometimes I need someone to actually help me sort out this brokenness that I have that has been caused by these things that I don't understand. And to have somebody help me unpack that is really valuable. And, um, yeah, I mean, the counselor that I see right now is a, is a Christian, and that's been really helpful for me because he understands the faith component of my journey and some of the challenges that I have from the church in my journey um, because he's been in it and has seen it firsthand. And so that that has been really helpful for me. Um, but at the same time, he's also has the training and the things to be able to pinpoint in. He'll see something that I say or something that I do, and he's like, something's off there, and he can chase it and help me unpack it and and discover it and it's been a very hard process honestly it's been challenging and i'm still very much in process i'm still dealing with things and and learning and growing um and but yeah i mean like james was saying i i too have gone through just some really really hard personal things some physical things um where my body was shutting down on me like physically shutting down and yeah like the panic attacks and anxiety attacks and things like that were happening as well and i didn't understand it because i tried to again go look to the answers of like well god can fix this but i i, I needed help like mm -hmm. i was broken and so to have those conversations and to be vulnerable and, and, and open up about those things, w you can't really do it from stage. Like in the middle of a concert, if I take an hour to like spill my guts <laughs> out, um, it's not the time or the place. I think the long form podcast is a great opportunity that we can convey our story, take people on a journey with us of where we've been and then bring them into where we are today. And then we can have a larger, longer conversation about, hope and the future and mm -hmm. and how other people who have experienced things like we've experienced or are going through similar issues or, or similar things um how they too can find hope and in healing and so that's something i think in this season of our lives where you hear about all these christian artists that leave the faith completely and deny their faith entirely uh friends of ours right guys that we know and have toured with and 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 you go, I don't understand. How could that happen? And James and I are sitting here going, I know exactly how that could happen. And I absolutely understand. Mm. And nobody's talking about the deeper story behind that. They just go, well, these guys left the faith. And then they kind of get just ostracized because now, you know, now they're out. They're not in the, in the circle of faith anymore. And it breaks my heart because we have good friends that we've worked with for years that we care about that no longer identify as Christians and their stories. Um, I, I absolutely understand it. The things that they experienced from the church and, and in the church culture and the wounds that they have. And I think some of those conversations are important to have. And so as we move forward, um, 
you know, we're going to continue with some of our stories and we don't want our podcast just to be this like super heavy every single day. You're like, Oh gosh, like <laughs> that was rough. Um, yeah. so we're really Those intentionally guys are sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're intentionally trying to have this kind of balance of like, we're trying to set a tone of fun things and fun stories from the road and things that'll make you laugh. And we have a good time together, but then it, you'll notice in every episode so far, we turn a corner and then we get serious about our story or our life or, or those kinds of things. And so that's kind of the format and the tone that we're looking to head into. Um, we still have some background to cover before I think we, we jump into some of those things. But I think James's episode was kind of the first one where we really got to dive into a bit of the deeper mm -hmm. struggles and because his childhood was very challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, What's interesting is my childhood was very opposite of James's. I grew up in the in the church in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. All of those things. So my childhood looked very different. Um, but I've I've got some real um, challenging things that I'm still unpacking today as a result of being within the church culture my entire life and how that affected mm -hmm. me and how that's affecting me today. And so we actually recorded my episode um, that uh, that like James did his, and then we did one of kind of my upbringing, my whole story. And uh, I was planning on releasing it this last week, and uh, couldn't do it. Um, just wasn't wasn't ready, wasn't there. I was dealing with some stuff personally and emotionally, and and so it's been postponed. And going to revisit it, and um, but this stuff is hard. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's challenging to dive into. And, and I'm going to talk about some stuff in that episode that I've never talked about publicly. Um, and so to, to put that out there and kind of bare my chest to the world for the first time, um, is, is hard, but mm -hmm. I think that there will be people that will hear it that need to hear it. And for us, we feel like this format and this vehicle is a great vehicle to get that conversation going. And then um, we're actually meeting this weekend, James and I, uh, and, a, and a couple good friends of ours. Um, we're going to be getting together to kind of refocus our vision for our nonprofit um, that we started a few years back. It's called EOTA Ministries. And it started out as an evangelistic outreach. Um, we It's a 501c3 that we started in order to facilitate large-scale evangelistic crusade-style events. And we've done a handful of them over the years. Uh, it was part of the funding as well for us to be over in Ukraine for a month while we were over there sharing the gospel. Um, there's, there's been a few things like that, that we've been able to do with that nonprofit. That's been really awesome, but we feel like in this next season that, that, uh, our focus and our ministry needs to shift to kind of this larger conversation of people who are hurting, who are struggling with faith, who are trying to figure out how to make heads and tails of, what they've been given in the church or, or the, there's so much hurt in the church is what I'm seeing. So many people that are wounded by the church and there's no place for them to safely have that conversation. And, and there's a lot of confusion there. And so what I tend to see is either people just stomach it and they move forward very unhealthy or they leave the church altogether and leave faith altogether and throw it all away. And I think that somewhere in that conversation needs to be, a healthy balance of no, I'm not going to like, there is still truth here and we need to very carefully dissect what is true from what is just fallen people that are a part of the church that have, that have wounded me. That's not necessarily God or the Bible that is responsible for that, but there's interpretations of the Bible. I've been taught things from the Bible that I just think were wrong, you know, and it doesn't mean that the Bible's wrong. It means that that perspective on that verse was wrong you know and mm -hmm. um the one i the one i like to 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 point at you know because it's like the obvious one but paul says i can do all things through christ who strengthens me right mm -hmm. and we put that on t-shirt slogans like christian high school basketball teams wear that as like their warm-up <laughs> jerseys like and we're like i that we interpret that as i can win 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 <laughs> right? Like this is the American interpretation. I can do anything. I can, I can win the championship. I can go to any, any heights. We can accomplish all of it. We can conquer all because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But if you actually zoom out and you look at that verse, what Paul is saying right before that is he's like, I've had money and I've had no money. I've had hard times and I've had good times. I've done it all. I've been in the worst of places and I've been in 
the best of places, irregardless of any of that, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And no one, no one is grabbing that verse culturally, generally. I'm not saying never, but generally we don't grab that verse and be like, man, my life is horrible right now and nothing is going right, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mm-hmm. Like that's not how we associate that verse. And yet I think that's where that verse is more powerful. Mm-hmm. And, and we like to package it in this, this rosy little place of like, I can conquer anything, but really maybe it just means that I can survive this deep, dark depression that I'm going through. And that's not the first verse that we usually grab for that. Right. And, and yet what Paul says is like, man, regardless of your circumstances, whatever you're going through, good or bad, I can, I can do any of it through Christ. Right. And so I, and I use that just as like a, it's kind of like the top level surface of a verse that we tend to use one way. And um, so anyways, yeah, that's a long, uh, long answer, but no, ultimately great, I think the long form podcast gives us a platform to be able to have some of these longer conversations and for guys like you, even that, you, you know, you've been listening to the podcast, you're going to get to know us in a way that you would have never had an opportunity otherwise. And I think that, I think that can be powerful. And, mm. and so that's really what we're, what we're chasing and we're going to have fun with it too. And, uh, the episode we just released is an episode. We interviewed a good friend of ours. Who's an Alaskan bush pilot and guide, and he's got the best stories and it's just a fun episode of like. Alaska and mm-hmm. bears and you know <laughs> float plane fishing and it's just cool. <laughs> yeah, I was telling Sean before before this, like I've well, I'm halfway through that episode. I'm almost caught up, but awesome. Cool. Didn't have quite enough time on my drive today, but uh, from the get go, like episode one after your intro episode, I felt there was so many times through that episode that I was, you guys are so natural at being hosts mm. and just your characteristics and your mannerisms and everything. Like it was just, I was sitting there. I'm like, dang, I'm f- like, I know these guys. I'm like, they're my buds. Like I relate so much on a lot of things that you guys were saying, especially when you were talking about like attack of the clones and, uh, I don't Ooh. know, like Nickelback, And you were just talking about all these things. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, Oh my goodness. Like, I wish I could chime in here. But, we're going to uh, lose all credibility on this podcast. By the yeah. time we're done here. They talk about- Taylor we're Swift supposed to make them want to listen to this, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I didn't say either way what was going on in those conversations. You got to, you got to hear their opinions. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, yeah, no, it was so far. It's been just so good, and it's it. I think hearing that side of you guys, like uh, I've never known much about you guys other than your music through my teenagehood and my adulthood, and now just through the beginning of this podcast getting to know you guys a little bit that way. And then now meeting you guys like this is just, yeah, it's surreal in a lot of ways, but (laughs) yeah, you guys are just chill, cool. And then like hearing all these like stories, it's, it's cool to get to know you guys in, in a way that obviously we don't have time to in just this conversation that now I can hear those stories more and more and just be like, you know, get the backstory in you guys. So it's really cool. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's been it's been so good so far. (laughs) Great, thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. We've always joked too that the what everyone gets to see from us is the best hour of our day. Right, the hour on stage is sometimes not the best hour of my (laughs) day. But (laughs) depending on how the show goes, right? But Mm -hmm. like that, they get to see that one hour, and and yet there's 23 other hours that happened around that. Mm that that no one no one gets to see and and those are the hours that really shape our life right like our our hour on stage is 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 great and it's you know it's something we we have the privilege of doing but that's not the bulk of our life right and the things that are happening around that is really um that's where real life exists cuz the show is the show is meant to be a show right there's lights and there's music and production and it's big it's larger than life and and it's meant to be in a in a sense an escape from real life for a minute to be be able to be caught up in a moment that's powerful and special um and it's that's why we love shows right cuz you can just be like enveloped in this thing that is wonderful and moving um but then the rest of the day still happens. And, and I think that's where I, I think it's, it'll, it's going to be neat to see as people hear 
about all of those other parts of life, I think there's going to be relatability and, and hopefully an opportunity to really um, help other people and encourage them. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you did it wrong. I, I don't, I was trying to figure out like, how do you, how do you yeah. do it? Like show them James, show them how on there it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. The correct. That's bad. <laughs> This is why no. we need. This is why we need video on our podcast, huh? yeah, so we yeah. can actually show people. <laughs> no Batman eyes on Batman stage. Batman eyes. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that was hilarious to listen to. <laughs> yeah. Also, part of the other twenty-three hours of the day, except yep. for the short season where it ended up in the one hour. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> awesome Sweet. well i don't yeah. want to take up any more of your guys time thank you so much for coming yes, on thank um, you so much it's really Definitely. been a pleasure um real quick before we go i just wanted to tell you guys a personal story about um how your guys music has affected my or i don't know if affected is the right word but has um has encouraged me i guess like i mentioned earlier how cutlass was like the first band i ever really got into um i mentioned this on our first episode way back like a year and a half ago but um, you guys were like the first concert I ever saw back at Fish Fest, gosh, Fish like 2005, <laughs> probably um, down cool. in Irvine, California. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I had never seen live music before. My parents took me, I think I was like eight or nine years old at the time. And I remember you guys uh, came out on stage. And uh, I remember John Micah, you, um, you ran out, you screamed into the microphone, took a swig of water, and then kicked the water bottle into the crowd and little like eight year old me thought that was like the coolest thing, like the most hardcore thing he had ever seen someone do. And I was just absolutely <laughs> loving it. I had never like, I never knew music uh, could be like loud like that. I hadn't heard rock music yeah. before. And then it was just like, just all downhill from there going into the heavier and heavier and heavier. Yeah. Music. Now he's into black metal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Cutlass is a episode, gateway but... drug. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to uh to to let you guys know that to tell that story on this podcast because I'd be remiss awesome. if I didn't get to say that. Thank you. That's great, man. Thank you. Man, thank you guys for having us on your podcast and just to all your listeners, thank you guys so much for supporting Cutlass for so many years. We love you. We're so excited about releasing this new music and Yes, Matt drums ninety seven. It is heavier than Hearts of the Innocent. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank yeah. you guys. So good. That is it for another episode of the Kingdom Core podcast. Thank you to each and every one of you who listened or watched this episode. It means a lot, and it's great to be back after this kind of long hiatus that was unplanned. Thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers, core givers of the $10 or more, Steve Michalowski, Anthony Kuchma, Frankie Blocker, and the Dead Pedal Coffee Company. Thank you so much for your continued support, even through our, our silence, and also to our previous subscribers as well. Everything that we were able to do and upgrade was thanks to you, and we got a lot more on the way, so stay tuned for that. Um, if you didn't know, you could follow me on Instagram at for the rock. Uh, I have my own separate ministry from Sean who does kingdom core. And uh, thank you to each and every one of you who comes in and checks out either of our stuff on there as well. Maybe you don't even follow us on there and you just randomly heard the podcast somewhere. Uh, and that's really awesome. Uh, we got one more episode planned for the last bit of the year. It'll likely come out a little closer to Christmas, give or take. Got that one already recorded, and we have one scheduled to record uh, that will be out in early January. I think you guys are going to be really stoked on that one. And that is it for this episode. Thank you so much. We will see you again soon.